Good afternoon and welcome to the Crux podcast, the podcast that we do after one of our Crux Thursday sessions so that anybody that missed the talk can still get from the wealth of the um, speaker and we can revisit the topic and I get to ask some of the questions that I wasn't um, able to get to when we had Q&A session in the lounge. So uh, last week we had a talk by Rolf Tillen on mature masculinity. And it was so funny seeing all of the men in the lounge. When I drove up, all I saw was just motorcycles in the parking lot, which was uh, very funny. I knew there were going to be mature masculine men there because I saw all of the all of the motorbikes. Uh, but Rolf, is, uh, he's in ministry in Salambosch in the Winelands area. He is married to Sonia and they have two boys. And he's recently become a grandfather and yep. his youngest has I'm recently... Married. Hey, Werner is the grandson. Werner is the grandson, and um, and his own son Stefan just won an Articofia Orators competition. So things are going great in the Tillen household. So Rolf, it's uh, so great having you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Leshin. It's a great privilege being here. Um, yeah, I've been a friend of um, JB for a long time, and um, I'm actually attending the Calvin course on uh, tomorrow. Um, with JB and you know I've known you for years as well and it's uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here thanks for having me. Rolf that's exactly that's exactly it is you know I got to know you at, at Bible school when you were one of my lecturers at Bible school and you were still lecturing on blood covenants and I remember how much you loved the Old Testament so I was so interested to see since then how your ministry has has moved into into masculinity. So I was wondering, how did you move from your love for Old Testament studies into a movement that seems more sociological, more psychological on on masculinity? So how did you how did you arrive at your study and your ministry in this area? Yeah, Lishan, it's a it's a good question. Um, I grew up um, in the old South Africa when traditional masculinity was the order of the day. And we actually didn't think much about it. You know, there was nothing to think about. It was simply, this is what the guys do. And then they go to the army. Um, and this is what the girls are going to do. So, you know, we had clear um, definitions of what we were going to do, but we didn't actually think about it. Um, although there was always some banter about being a man or not, you know, and I mean, the army, there's obviously a lot of pressure. So I never thought about this much. Okay. And then I got, um, I got saved. I converted, um, at the age of 22. Um, and I was passionate about Jesus and the ministry. And I went into that, into pastoral ministry at Shofar Christian Church in 93, 94, actually. Um, and then, you know, things were fine. But over time, I started realizing when Yohanan, my eldest, especially when he was 15 or 16 years old, I realized that the young men um, were experiencing a lot of pressure and pushback that we as young men had not had in terms of gender identity, gender confusion, gender definitions. <clears throat> Sorry, apologies, um, and all of that. Um, but the but but the actual real um, pivot, so, so I, I became aware that even for church life and for church activities, gender definitions were becoming more and more, more important. What we used to accept um, as non-negotiables was being negotiated and discussed a lot. Um, and then Sonia and I at that stage, um, this was when I was 38, it's quite a while ago, maybe 15, 17 or 17 years ago, we were running the children's church at Shofar. And so there was a requirement to upgrade the course and then we did a, a lot of reading and we just started reading quite wildly and by the grace of God I ended up with a book in my hands called um, five stages um, in, a, in the in a man's life and so I am um, it was also some of the chapters related to joyful parenting how to be a parent that um, encourages and instills joy in your child's life through eye contact um, you know things that as a man, I wasn't used to. I mean, I know there are other books, um, Kustri Baba, which talks about this as well. I mean, it's obviously quite well known for in the in the psychological world. But anyway, I wasn't exposed to it. So I read this book, Five Stages in a Man's Life. And then a profound thing happened to me. In the chapter on man, um, so we'll talk about the five stages later, infant boy, young man, father, elder. But in the chapter on man, 
Um, I was sitting, and I remember the incident so clearly. I was sitting on a chair in front of the window reading the book. And then Jim Wilder says in the book, he says, the, a man can meet the emotional needs of a woman. A boy cannot. And I was fascinated. But I, I remember I physically shrank down and slid behind the windowsill um, in a sort of an embarrassed shock. And I was wondering whether the neighbors knew I was a boy. So um, it, was a, it was a profound moment. Um, a man can meet the emotional needs of a woman. A boy cannot. Now, my, my, my background on that point is my mother, my grandfather was a very hard um, Afrikaans um, policeman and my father's German. So my mother didn't have a lot of huggy kissy um, dad or husband. And so my mother and I had a very intense emotional relationship up to the age of about 10. But when a boy starts becoming uh, adolescent, you don't want to sit on your mother's lap anymore and laugh at all the jokes. Um, and so when I started detaching from my mom, she took it very badly. Anyway, and I experienced neediness in my mother, which I didn't understand as a teenage boy. Um, and my father, although he was always present and faithful and patient and kind, he wasn't a talkative guy. And so he didn't actually input all that much from an emotional or spiritual um, point in my life. Anyway, so my mother, I, I experienced my mother's needy. Okay. So fast forward, I don't know, 10 years, I get married. And so in the first day or first week or whatever, early in our marriage, I said to Sonia, who's a really magnificent woman, honestly, um, you, you know her. Um, I said to her, listen, baby, a woman's emotional needs is like a black hole. And no man can meet those needs. And you've got to go to God and he will meet your needs and he will fill your love tank. And then when your love tank is full and you're completely stable and sound, then you can come to me and we can have a peer relationship. And Sonia bursts out in tears. And I'm like, yep, point in case, look at this. How do I deal with this? Anyway, okay. So I said to her, I wasn't going to be able to meet her emotional needs. And my wife is a really... A, a tough um, woman she she's really amazing anyway and so she bit on a lip and then we were married um we and and 15 years into our marriage i read this book that says a man can meet the emotional needs of a woman a boy cannot and i'm like whoa um and i was quite excited because on the one hand i was convinced that i couldn't meet my wife's emotional needs because i experience women as very complicated and very elaborate in the way they engage um, and that would tend to exhaust me as a man emotionally. I wouldn't be able to go more than two, three minutes and then I'd be finished. Um, and yeah, this guy says that's not correct. A boy will be exhausted and a boy cannot uh, meet a woman's needs, but a man can. Okay, so then I went to Sonia and I said, listen, look here, baby. This book says that I can meet your emotional needs. And Sonia's elated. And then I finished the book. Um, and that changed my life. Um, and Sonia will testify, it changed our marriage. And so I then, from the age of 38, Sonia's very gracious. So she says, I, I was an 18-year-old boy, you know, at least I was uh, not 12. Um, and I was a righteous boy and a preaching boy and a Christian boy, but I was a boy. Um, and then I faced the fact that I was a boy and I started learning what does it take to meet the emotional needs of a woman. And we're going to talk about that probably later on. So I don't want to dive into that too deeply. But when I was reading that, I remember the evenings lying on my bed, 20, not, not quite 20, 17 years ago, reading this book and knowing this was absolutely tectonic plate shifting revelation. Um, how men start engaging with their own emotions, develop emotional maturity for themselves, which then enables them to engage with women in a meaningful and life-giving fashion. Anyway, so that's how I got into it. And then by default, I just, wherever I went, I started talking about this. And that then turned into a ministry. So that's how I got here. Yeah, I remember that teaching and I remember just my heart also sinking thinking, wow, is that a Christian woman is expected to, you know, not have any emotional needs from her husband, just go sit at the Lord's feet. And I remember, and I know the spirit that it was taught in, but the practicality of oh. then, you know, how it played out, obviously, 
you know, if sinful nature, if it hears it has an easy out and it actually doesn't have to adhere to some responsibility and the Lord is, is, is you know, happy with you for not having to, to adhere no, to this responsibility. I, I, I can only apologize to all the women in the world and say um, it's a tragedy, you know, that they um, have to deal with this. And the funny thing is whenever I promote this course, I have to be careful because if there are women in the room, they get so excited about it. <laughs> If I say there aren't any men in church, only boys, <laughs> the men are not happy and the women get very excited. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a massive need. But why? So you're referring to this book, The, the Stages in a, in a Man's Life by James E. Wilder. Um, how did it come across your path? Was it a recommendation? How did you even think to pick it up? How how did you know you were in a space in your life where you, you were even interested in reading anything about masculinity? Yeah, well, as I, as I mentioned briefly, we were doing the um, parenting at Shofar and we were asked to upgrade the course. Um, and so we started reading quite um, widely. Um, and there was a lady in the church, Mother Lian, and she had a book, Joyful Parenting. Um, and it was about the need for parents to spend a lot of um, face time, eyeball to eyeball with their babies, especially infants and newborns, because this stimulated joy in the little child's brain. And this is a profound concept, um, which Jim Wilder now teaches on in detail. Okay, but this book, Joyful Parenting, then referred to Jim Wilder a lot. Um, and so Marilyn had gotten hold of the Jim Wilder book. And I actually remember the day I asked her, could I borrow this book and read it? And she gave it to me. And it's one of the most important days of my life. So accidentally, we came across it while trying to upgrade the parenting course. Um, and then it totally upgraded me <laughs> as a man. I, got, I went through a massive upgrade. That's how I discovered the book. So I'm going to ask you to do the impossible and see, can you maybe talk us through these stages? I know they the different stages that are described in the book and, and each is a whole adventure on its own. Um, yeah. But maybe if somebody does get this book, what what's a map that they can go through? And if, if somebody would like to, um, you know, benefit from your ministry. What 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 kind of stages are we are we looking at? How how does Wilder explain uh, a, a mature masculinity? Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's he's very good at this. Now, a couple of things. Einstein. Okay. Everybody says Einstein said Einstein said. I realized later on it may, might not have been Einstein, but in this case, I actually checked it, and Einstein did say something very similar to this. Einstein said that genius is the ability to make a complex problem simple. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Jim Wilder is maybe the most intelligent person whose books I've ever read because he takes this incredibly complex thing of male and female and then specifically male immaturity and all the um, trouble we have, you know, the boy crisis, um, the perpetual boyhood, this whole Peter Pan syndrome that's overrun the world. The whole um, issue of MGTOW, men going their own way and incels. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's an intense amount of malfunction with young men. Um, okay, so Einstein, um, yeah, okay, so Einstein said genius is the ability to make a, co a complex problem. And I can simply say Dr. Jim Wilder is a genius. Um, and what he came up with, Einstein said something else also. He said that if you cannot explain it to a six year old, then you don't understand it yourself. So one of the things that I really love about Jim Wilder's ministry, and he's got an elaborate ministry. They've got a ministry. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of Christian psychologists. He actually, um, interestingly enough, calls himself a neurotheologian. It's quite an wow. interesting concept. A brain -tuloog. Anyway, a neurotheologian. He's got a ministry called Life Model, um, and then practical ministry online called Life Model Works. And they've written a, a massive amount of material, brilliant material, um, all aimed at this whole issue of um, joy as a therapeutic tool and how joy relates to the human brain, um, the male and, well, well, the left brain and the right brain, essentially. The left brain being the rational, logical brain um, and the right brain being the emotional brain. And so one of the basic postulations that Jim makes in the book from a physiological point of view is that the female brain is more holistic and the, um, the, the two lobes, the red and the, and the right lobe, are actually uh, connected uh, uh, like, you know, on a, on a holistic with a very broad 
on a very broad base. And literally the corpus callosum, which is the portion in between for the female brain is much bigger, making the female brain, um, the emotion and, and the rational processes much more integrated. The male brain tends to look more as two separate lobes with the corpus callosum in between smaller, okay? This is just physio physiology. And I recently actually went to check that. And the funny thing is, the universities in the world that had the best information on it was Stanford University and UCLA. I was so surprised because I thought these hyperliberal universities would now try and say male and female brains don't differ. But the, the reality is they physiologically differ. Okay. And functionally, they differ um, dramatically also. So I just want to put that as a background. So uh, before I get into the five stages, which I can run through actually um, quite quickly, because... Because this model, um, which Jim Wilder calls the life model, because it is genius. So we can actually dial it up and dial it down. The, the amount of intensity and the amount of detail we'll share on it is actually quite scalable. We can, as I say, we, I can talk for a week or I can talk for 10 minutes. Um, currently, I'm running this course regularly on uh, Thursday evenings in two hour sessions. I invite young men over to my house. We have dinner together and then we talk to our session, but it can actually also be done in a 40-minute session, five 40-minute sessions. So the thing dials up and dials down quite quickly. And it, um, according to the appetite and the, the time, the availability of the audience. So this makes this model, the life model, um, for me, absolutely fantastic. So if there are complex psychological questions, we can deal with it. And if we just want a little five-point short um, a tip of the day type uh, angle, we can actually do it like that. So there's a two pager, there's a five pager, there's a 200 pager, and there's a 2000 pager, you know, depending on what, what your appetite is. Um, and, and that makes it extremely useful for me. It really makes it useful. I can just use this while I'm actually ministering on a spiritual level, or I can just, you know, unpack it. And if I run into something serious in the, in the young man's life, then we can sit down, slowly work through it, and there's tons of supplementary material that attach to each one of the stages. Okay, that's the intro. Now, the stages are infant, 0 to 4, boy, 4 to 12, young man, 12 to the birth of your first child, father, first child to maturity of your last child, till your last child is an adult, which in psychological terms should be achieved at the age of 12, which is a radical concept for the West. And a very profound um, thing also, because it means that children, including boys, are supposed to reach emotional maturity, emotional adulthood before puberty. Okay? So this whole teenage crisis, Sturm und Drang, and all the things that are creating so much trauma in families and wherever else, is actually would be much less intense if we actually achieved adulthood for um, children, but now typically um, males before the age of 12, which is actually physiologically what it's supposed to be doing. Now, just a quick aside, and Jim says this quite clearly in his um, book in the introduction, that girls go through the same five stages as men. Um, infant, girl, young woman, mother, and then elder, or whatever, wife of an elder, or however we'd like to call that. Um, but girls mature quite successfully. Girls mature at a much higher success rate than young men. And one of the reasons for this is um, the male brain, because of the smaller corpus callosum. Males have, they do have fewer emotions numerically um, than females and they have the emotions at a lesser intensity than females and they also have the ability to pause their emotions now i think it's a design feature from god is that males can pause their emotions because under certain circumstances if you're walking with your family in the felt and a lion storms at the family you are supposed to load the gun and shoot the lion without getting emotional and then once you've remain completely calm, non-emotional, and you kill the lion, then you can have your emotional breakdown and your nervous uh, breakdown and collapse and scream and yell, rejoice or whatever. But but it is a known fact that males have the ability, um, a generally attested scientific fact that males have the ability to suppress their emotions much more effectively than females. Okay, 
So this does give a little bit of functional advantages in certain circumstances, but it actually has got a problem. And that is that emotional trauma, even for girls, is not always comfortable. I mean, when you are experiencing sadness or fear or disgust or shame, it's not actually necessarily pleasant. But the girls don't have the ability to suppress their emotions as effectively as males. But the young man just presses pause, or the boy, in fact. He just presses pause. He's not going to have the emotion. Then when the emotion wants to surface later, he presses pause again. And he continues pressing pause because it's just so much more easy to press pause than actually deal with an emotion like shame. Men are sometimes prepared to deal with anger. Um, fear is not a popular topic for men, but shame. You were humiliated at work. And your wife asks you, how was your day? Very few men are going to say, baby, I was humiliated at work and I feel ashamed. It's just something men don't do. So pause button, boom. And because men are able to pause these emotions, they mature at a much lower rate, much less um, effectively than the girls. So much so, and this is, this is devastating stats, is that Jim Wilder reckons that 80% of 50-year-old American males or infants. Now we'll deal with what is an infant. It's not just an insult or a slur. There's a scientific definition um, of what is an infant. Um, and that, that's devastating. So it also, I think, runs, I mean, my, my observation, my basic observation is that the average woman is going to get 75 or 80% for being a good woman. Easy. Um, and similar numbers for being a mother. But the average man is not going to get 80% for being dad. I think the average dad gets like 25, 30%. I mean, maybe I'm a bit severe, but, but the men rate much lower. Anyway, in fact, that's why this book was written because it is a big, huge problem, the boy problem, the boy crisis, the Peter Pan syndrome. This is a problem for boys. They do not mature um, emotionally as successfully as the girls. Okay, so now genius is the ability to make a complex problem simple and Jim has solved this problem. He really has. I, I am like sold out. I've been doing this for more than 15 years and I'm, I'm, I can't see myself changing. I will upgrade if something better comes along, but I haven't found anything. Okay, so infant means that you are, Alicia, please interrupt me. I'm monologuing like crazy here. So oh, um, no, I, no, that's, this is your time. Take us through the stages. Okay. Okay, so infant is zero to four years old, and, and the essential definition of infant is that the infant is powerless and mom must solve all the problems. Now, especially in the first four years, your mother is much more um, equipped and able emotionally and physically to meet the needs of the newborn um, and, and then the toddler. The father is supposed to be present, very supportive, um, but but point man is mom in this instance for these four years. Okay, so um, then the boy, the boy child, the little girls go through the same thing. But as I said, we're going to speak in the male gender, although the same applies to the girls. The thing is just the girls just absolutely, they just, just, just much more successful at this um, because they don't suppress their emotions. So the um, boy then, the, the infant, mommy must define all these problems tell him what's going on and solve the problem. So when the baby screams, mom says, um, uh, Tuma, Tuma, you are afraid and I will comfort you. Or, um, you know, she comforts the baby. What is English for Tuma, Tuma? I forgot what, what the appropriate is. Anyway, the mom picks the baby up, comforts the baby, throws the baba, um, and then says, you are hungry, you must eat. Um, and that's how the little brain learns to speak um, the mother's tongue and also to de to de to to define its own emotions to discern I'm hungry I'm tired I'm afraid um, I'm wet uh, um, or I just had a fright whatever and the mother will then verbalize and say you just had a fright don't worry I'll hug you or you're lonely don't worry I'll be with you or you're tired don't worry you can sleep Okay, and that is, uh, as basic as it may sound, it is a profound life-changing skill. It sounds so basic. But the ability to verbalize emotional needs like that is a massive skill that the average American male, I say American because, I mean, it would apply to all Western cultures. Uh, we, we, we'll probably talk a little bit about um, Africa and China or, you know, other, other cultures a little bit. Um, but the average um, Western male 
if if his wife asks him how was your day, all he says is fine. Um, what happened? Nothing. Um, and the reason is because the males did not learn to verbalize their emotions, and they're not comfortable at talking about their emotions. Um, and that is essentially the definition of immaturity. So when Jim Wilder says the average, well, 80% of 50-year-olds in America are infant, it's because they don't know themselves. They're not in contact with themselves. They actually can't tell you, I'm ashamed, I'm angry, um, I'm in love, um, I'm happy, um, I'm insecure, I'm ambivalent. They, they don't, they're not able to verbalize. And I mean, these are just the big six emotions. I mean, there are many emotions, obviously. Um, and one needs to be able to, to, to give a name to the emotion. Because as soon as you understand the emotion, you verbalize it correctly, then you're able to meet the need. If you say, if you know the difference between being hungry and being lonely, then that is, you've, you've passed your infant task. Because a little baby doesn't know the difference between being hungry and being lonely. The baby just knows something is wrong and it screams. And then the mom comes and solves the problem. Okay, so that's infant. Powerless, mom solves all the problems. But the infant is learning. Boy um, is then the age 4 to 12, and the boy now must learn to take care of one person, namely himself. That's the essence of being a boy. So boys must learn to dress themselves, go to bed, make their own um, sandwiches, um, shower, do their own homework, earn pocket money, stuff like that. That's a boy. But the boy must also learn to verbalize his emotions um, and find the correct solution for each emotion. If you're lonely, find a friend. If you're hungry, eat something. If you're ashamed, okay, that's a pretty complex one. Talk to your dad, talk to your mom, deal with shame. Don't suppress shame and then do not default to addictive um, activities such as computer games, pornography, drinking, smoking, sport even. These things are often addictions and they're masking underlying emotions that the boys are unable to verbalize. Um, and that is that is the boy challenge. So the boy must then get encouragement from both parents um, in to, to, to verbalize the emotional need and to actually start facing the fact that he is, okay, most men are comfortable with being angry. Anger is seen as a male emotion, but shame and humiliation, it's not discussed. Men don't talk about it. If a man is ashamed or humiliated, he just won't talk to anybody about it. Um, and that's the essence of the immaturity. And women know this, and women desire men to start talking about their emotions, because as soon as the men talk about emotions, I mean, that's just, that's next level in terms of in, in intimacy, and then the guy's um, ability to actually, you know, meet the needs of, of the woman in his life whether girlfriend, wife, or even mother, whatever, the women around you, even colleagues at work, you're able to relate to the emotions that women typically feel. Um, this is very satisfying for women. Um, and then despite the fact that the men are now in contact with the emotions, they still would have fewer emotions, less intense emotions, and they would be more inclined to produce rational solutions uh, and in that sense, they are useful to women um, in terms of what the Bible calls ruling. An elder must rule over his household. Rule is a strong language. It's not violent. It's not brutal. It doesn't mean oppress or crush or abuse at all. But it does mean that you bring direction and you bring order. And this is what an elder is supposed to do. However, on average, most married men in America or infant or boy and therefore big disaster because that poor woman she's got three kids and then another big kid you know it's just a disaster anyway so this is and it's not difficult to fix actually all you need is a little bit of courage and a little little bit of faith and then you read the book and you go for it okay 4 to 12 boy learns to look after one person name himself young man is from 12 to the birth of your first child and the essential difference between a young man and a boy is that a young man learns team play. The boy learns to look after one person, namely himself, physically and emotionally. The young man learns to look after more than one person, himself and his friend, to begin with male friends. But as soon as they are um, adept at, at, at plural satisfaction, at not just only win-win relationships, which is typically what boys conduct, um, they, they're able to conduct plurally satisfying relationships, mutual, mutual satisfaction, 
that makes a young man eligible to date. Infants and boys shouldn't date because they're selfish and they are consumeristic still. Even a good boy is, is, is a blessing, hallelujah, a boy. But he's still a consumer and he's still not um, eligible for dating and for um, deep emotional engagement with a woman because he's still going to be so, uh, uh, selfish and therefore exploit the girl. A young man learns to understand his own needs, but also the other person's needs and to meet those needs. Okay, and that's, that is then massive, massive maturity. And I think all the women listening to the schools will scream, hallelujah, all the men go to the course. I, I mean, imagine that, my own wife. She definitely, okay. So then I got, then I grew up. Then I realized I've got to face my own emotions and then I've got to verbalize them, workshop them with my wife. And that's what emotional maturity is all about. Cool. Okay. So young man is then um, 12 to your first child. And that's an era of team play, an era of mutuality. It's also important that the power that a man has must not be used to exploit women or other men because men are powerful and they can abuse that power. And that's what the world is freaking out about when they say toxic masculinity. They've got a point when they say toxic masculinity, but at this stage, everything that's male is also labeled toxic masculinity. Everything's now toxic. Okay, and so that's a problem. We need to fix that. Some of it is indeed toxic, but a lot of it isn't. We just need to contextualize these things properly, which means we must have talkative men who can verbalize these things clearly. Okay, father is then the era where your you, you have kids and I don't think that's rocket science everybody knows what happens to a father a good father sacrifices everything for the child and everything for the mother who he must support while she's going through this incredible um, demanding process of motherhood she's breastfeeding she's awake at night there's a whole bunch of challenges and the father must pick up the slack so that young man who now functions in complete unselfishness while at the same time still being emotionally engaged and emotionally aware and powerful that's a father praise god we all want those i mean it's like not not hard. this is not a hard sell um okay and then elder is simply when all your kids are big and they well they don't have to be out of the house jim says that if uh if, if your youngest is 13 and successfully adult then you are can be a father to the fatherless interesting thing that he does say that we shouldn't engage in sacrificial ministry a lot of time away from home while uh, we still have small children um elders he's got a whole entire chapter on an elder too soon talking about gifted christian ministers who go into missions or are spending long time away from home um at the expense of their own families and then later on this anointed man of god Big success in ministry, big disaster at home, and the kids are not serving Christ. And the reason is daddy was never at home. So elders must first raise their own children. And when your youngest is 13, then you start engaging in heavy duty, sacrificial ministry, father to the fatherless, that kind of stuff. Doesn't mean you can't engage in ministry, obviously involved in church and stuff. And you can go away for short mission trips and things, but you can't just... Go throw yourself to it while you've got small kids. Okay, and that's it. That's the summary. Infant, boy, young man, father, elder. I'm sure anybody that's heard that now, just it's such a broad overview that, you know, the only way to get the, the real meat is to read the book and, and maybe, you know, like attend your sessions for, for training and workshopping. Like you say, the, the importance is I, I can read a a book on how to drive the car but you know i need to actually have an instructor instructor sit with me and and that's such a such a lack that we have is you know there's so few few mentors that are adult enough to be able to to raise the the generation so it's i think it's an important ministry that you've got i'm um I'm also, I'm perpetually online so i completely am so aware of all of these um, American summaries of what is wrong with masculinity. Uh, and I completely see what they talk about when they complain about the girl boss and all of these Hollywood movies are starting to fail now because it's always this flawless brunette heroine that is just the strongest and the fastest and the funniest and it's, women can do no wrong. And it's definitely, I would say in the, in the West, the, the rise of the matriarchy that does add to to what we see with with the MGTOW and the and the and the incels and just broken masculinity. But I I do wonder in the South African context 
if suppression by women is is the biggest threat to mature masculinity in our context, and I'm not sure what it could be in, in the South African context, I'm not convinced it's the rise of women or, or the power of women over South African men, but if it's not if it's not a matriarchy, then what in South Africa do you think is contributing to to our our, our level of broken masculinity? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Lucian. That is a really good question, you know. And in one sense, okay, uh, Jim Mulder is the genius, and he wrote <laughs> for the American culture, and it does apply to, um, I think, to a large extent, to the Western elements in South Africa. Uh, um, but but the the broader South African context, I think the, the the obvious thing is there is a cultural difference. There there are some cultural backgrounds. The way Africa typically did family, they weren't so um, monogamous as the as the West. Um, there was always a village raising a child. Although um, Europeans are also saying this now, I think it's an African proverb. Um, so in in one sense, there was more of a community to take up the slack. Or in African um, communities. I'm speaking under correction, but I think that's true. Um, but with colonialism um, and in South Africa, with the um, Groups Area Act and the movement of labor, removing the males, the fathers from the families, that is a, it's a devastation. Um, and the fatherless in South Africa is a, is a massive problem. You know, I think it's like 70% of children don't know their father, spend no time with their father. Um, and, and the funny thing is, I, I find that African fatherlessness is actually less devastating than European fatherlessness. I, it's just my observation. When I talk to young white guys about their fathers, they're all upset and angry because their father wasn't good enough. Um, but with uh, black and, and other uh, South Africans, I, I find they are actually not as devastated overtly. They're not as aware of the problem. Problem because there is a little bit of a, um, a a cultural, there is a little bit of a village thing um, with Ubuntu that does actually pick up some of the slack. And the level of pain and devastation is, I think, actually less, um, weirdly enough, um, although the absence of the father is, is much more. But having spoken to, um, you know, quite a few young um, black, black men, um, pastors, people ministering on, on all levels and, you know, to, to understand that they, it's essentially the same problem. I mean, it, it, it definitely, it, it looks a little, a little bit different because there is, as I say, uh, there is a more communal, joyful, happy family village scenario that comes from classic Ubuntu, from the villages, which, as I say, picks up some of the slack. But but the simple reality is a point is his father to teach him how to hunt, how to talk to his wife, how to make the budget, how to work hard, you know, the, 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 that devastation exists in the broader term too. Um, yeah, so this is a long conversation, you know, and I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not completely an expert at it, but that's my observations. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions? Uh, absolutely. It's, and as a woman that wants to fix things, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to know that because I am a woman, there are just areas into a man's life that I can say the right words and I can do all the right things. And there's just an importation that will never drop. It's just not the same. Um, I've, I've held broken men in my arms and I've said all the right words to them. And I've even had one say to me that there's the scene in Goodwill Hunting where Robin Williams takes uh, Matt Damon just by the shoulder, his character. And it's also a very fatherless character. And you just keep saying, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault until um, the character of Good Goodwill Hunting breaks. And and I've had a friend say to me, I need an elder to say to me what you are saying to me now. My head can hear it, but it's not dropping in my heart. It's and it's so what do you, like once that chain is broken, where do you get elders to even oh. restart that engine? It's yeah. how do you, like how do you fix that supply chain? Because lack of elders begets lack of elders. Oh, Lucian, that is the single biggest problem in the West. I, I I'm convinced of it. I often say to people, um, if I could have a million dollars or a proper elder in my life, I take the elder to have an older man that understands your challenges 
and then at the, and then ministers to you without trying to subjugate you or somehow recruit you into his church or his army. You have no idea how rare that is. To find an older man who talks to you with, with fatherly intent, which means it's not your mother. I mean, your father is harder on you than your mother. Your father is going to put a lot more pressure on you and take a lot less rubbish and be much more brutal and direct with you than your mother. But you are so, so, so right that, uh, uh, you know, it takes a man to make a man out of a boy. A woman cannot do that. And um, um, it's it's also true that masculinity, and I mean, you know, I, I read widely on this. I mean, I read very widely on this. One of my favorite resources also is the Academy of Ideas. They're also actually Canadians like Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson himself, um, you know, and they say also that masculinity must be confirmed by the community of men. Um, the men must tell the boy he's a man. The, a woman, he'll never believe the women, regardless of what happens, you know. Um, and often there's a lot of sexual exploitation when boys go to women and try and establish masculinity. When a boy tries and establish masculinity from a girl, it's, it's typically sexual abuse. It, it, because what's he going to do? Um, because what she says isn't going to work for him. But when he finds himself in the community of men, and they then actually, well, they have to put him through the, the man who tests, you know. And I think one of the surprises, which might not um, sound very, well, intuitive in our God is love, unconditional love culture, is that manhood actually must be achieved through a dangerous process. Uh, and JB and I, we still had the privilege of going through this dangerous process called the South African Army. Um, and it was a freaking dangerous process. I mean, I had guys dying with me in, in, in training. We had guys dying and we, we had guys failing. And the weird thing is unconditional love doesn't work for men. It's so weird. Um, it doesn't work for men. If you tell, if you tell a guy, listen, all the girls in town, uh, they, 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 they love you despite you being a washout. <laughs> it's just not going to affirm him. It's not going to solve his problem. A man needs to be told the girls, uh, respect you because you're so powerful um it, it, failure you know god loves you despite you being a washout it doesn't work for men i'm so sorry to say um men need to achieve success this success needs to be achieved through the bar mitzvah process typically your father needs to prepare you for the rite of passage a dangerous process that your mother would never approve of because you can die uh, and then you will be, I mean, uh, this Academy of Ideas, these other two Canadian guys, they say that the village elders will abduct the young men away from their mothers and then put them through a dangerous process in which they could die. But those who do not die but succeed, they are affirmed as men and they return to the village with the approval of the other men as having achieved manhood. Um, I mean, in the Maasai culture, the young man has to kill a lion. I mean, this is not like a joke. He has to kill a lion in order to become a man. Okay, so nobody's going to question him after that. Um, and the the uh, that 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 comes from that is um, it's it's tangible, and the girls can smell it. They know when they are dealing with men who've survived battle. I mean, you know, as I said, the privilege of being in the old South African army. After the army, we went to Mayuba. All the army guys were in Mayuba, and nobody tried to 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 sell equality to us there. Everybody knew we were two years older than the rest, and we had commanded men in battle. And <laughs> no, they didn't try and convince you about the equality thing. Uh, life was very different. But I have friends that died in the army. It's that's that's how it works. I've got buddies who died. Yeah, when you were describing the that transition from from boy into man, and and the importance of the ceremony of it, of the formalization, the actual right that it's not just a process that you assume is going to happen naturally. Somebody has to make an actual declaration. Um, mm -hmm. And I I was I was wondering, like you know, with, we we are seeing record numbers of teenagers now manifesting all kinds of coming out ceremonies on their own you know that it's this massive coming out as gay or coming out as trans and it's a big celebration and you get a new name and you get new pronouns and maybe you get a new appearance and I wonder to what degree especially in our boys do we see these teenagers yearn for this transition state 
just because we don't have any rites of passage left anymore that transitions from boy into man. So I guess you, you have to transition into something that's more socially acceptable. And if that is the case, we don't have the army anymore. We barely have any danger in our lives. Most of our fathers would, like you said, it is shocking to our culture to start referring to a 13-year-old boy as a man. So yeah. how are we, where, if I have a, a boy that says to me, I have this deep, deep need to be affirmed as a man, where can modern boys go to even experience such a, such a right? What is the modern solution for, the, for a society that has, has lost this ability to celebrate this transition? Listen, that is a million dollar question. Um, but the thing is, there are many, there are many men's ministries. Most churches are, are actually aware of this and engaging more and more. I had a coffee date earlier today um, with a young man who is an old boy from Paul Ruiz. Um, and he is a law student and he is spending a lot of time with my youngest, Stefan, who's 17 now, the one who won the Arctic of Fear. And it's this, this, this guy, Amian. Who actually? Oh, Mian is part of Jay, a uh, part of Crux. Uh, yeah, I had lunch, a, a coffee with Mian. Anyway, um, and and Mian and I said, sp speaking about this, you know, that we need to create these platforms. We need to create these fraternities. We need to create ministries and things everywhere, um, where we can pull the young men in, put them through difficult um, things to do, uh, cause them to pass tests that everybody doesn't pass because that is unfortunately part of it. Um, and, and just get creative about it. I mean, I don't think war or hunting or whatever is the only way to deal with it. In fact, it's not. So I think we must just know, understand the problem and get creative about it. I appreciate a school like Paul Ruiz a lot. Um, our dear friend Raymond, you know, had a lot to say about, you know, tongue in the cheek, the toxic masculinity at Paul Ruiz, but how it protects the boys, you know. Um, and there is still such a culture of gentlemen, gentlemanly. A Paul Ruser is a gentleman, you know. So that's something we can simply just go and protect. We can ask the rest of the society go and protect that school. It is, it's still looking very good, I must say. I don't know how they managed to keep so watertight, but the school is, I like it. I like it a lot. So there are many things that we can do. There are budding men's ministries in most churches. Most serious churches are aware of this problem. Um, and, and, and and creating opportunities for older men and younger men to meet. And I think a lot happens, um, Lishan, and this I've just seen, when the old guys and the young guys just hang together. And this this I definitely learned from Jordan Peterson is that he just pointed out that men are more physical than women. More Men are much more inclined to get physical in terms of um, their confrontation um, than women. Um, and so what we often have is we've got hiking together. Um, I've actually take groups of young men to a local farm here, yeah, and we simply just chop wood. We cut trees down with a chainsaw and, and chop them up, you know, just as a Saturday morning activity. And I mean, we actually need the wood and it's a black wattle that's um, alien invasion, uh, invader species here in the area. Um, and then you know what? When the young man who is a, a bit of a nerd and a bit of a pen pusher stands there with a the chainsaw that's got the ability to cut his shin off, <laughs> well, then we have our danger element and we have to all pray um, because this young guy has got a chainsaw in his hand and guess what? Things can go wrong. So um, I, I think we should understand it, the principles. We don't really, I mean, the army's gone for now, might come back um, in the near future, who knows? But you know, we can just go and do things. And, and intentionality from the older men will, will make a big difference. And what I found remarkably successful, I discovered this by accident, but now everybody's confirming this. If you group, uh, if you run groups where you've got 50-year-olds, uh, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-old, and even school children together, males, there's something magic that happens when you've got the, the 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 generations split like that. Often the old men think that they're not the pastor and they can't teach and preach, so they don't have to and should not be do, doing the talking. But if you throw them into mixed groups where you've got older men and younger men together, then basic stuff like how do you make your budget work when you just got married, or how do you do you actually spank your children? Yes or no? Do you? 
How do you how do you do date night? I mean, it can be most basic question. And then there is there's this just I I found it to be extremely successful to have 30 year olds and 40 year olds um, married people, even young married with students. So I think there's a lot of stuff that that just happens um, quite quite um, by impartation. It's just literally a case of spending time together. It's not the army, but it's already a huge step forward. And if you add to that, say a tough hike, take 10 boys for the Fish River Canyon or something like that, or just up Stellenbosch Mountain even, you know, you have to run it over a little period of time. There's a lot of good things, you know. I'm also a big fan of The World Needs a Father. Cassie Carson's ministry that actually started in Stellenbosch and is the whole world. So there are many, many, many ministries and one should find them and support them, but they are there. And I think there is a lot of hope. And I think there also is from a spiritual, uh, social and moral point of view, the need for male leadership is very clear. And uh, I think as we start talking about those things, we can, a lot's going to happen. I think we'll be able to do a lot. You know, and then you have to run small groups. I mean, it's small groups, you know, many small groups, you know. So how many can we reach one at a time? Starfish principle, one at a time. But let's start going, you know. Uh, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot. Rolf, I tried to ask, ask this question in the lounge too. And I, I, I guess this is the area where I need the most help to develop compassion. <laughs> because... I hear the pain. I absolutely do understand the pain of modern masculinity. But I look at modernity and what is expected of a person contributing to society in modernity. And I also hear you saying that a man matures through suffering, uh, a type of has to go through pain and danger to push through to learn how to live a life that you know takes from the selfish to the sacrificial and then jb also quit, quoted doug wilson's quote where he says that masculinity is the glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility so i see the nature of men and i see the needs of society and i don't see them exactly match because we're not at war currently we're not very few of us are still in agriculture. Very few of us get to work with our hands in the dirt. And it seems like men are happy to suffer as long as suffering feels like play. But when when we when we ask them, can you sit in front of a computer and just fill in your spreadsheets? Then it is, then it's oppression. Or when we ask them, can you sit still in a classroom and listen to the teacher and do your homework and do your writing? Then we get accused of turning them into girls. But that's what society needs right now. It needs people who can sit and listen and think and emote. Even, um, you know, like you'll see uh, in, in American circles, for example, the, the new phrase is the long house. Every time a woman tries to teach a man how to talk about their, their feelings, then the long house is turning the boy into a girl. So my, my question is just if, if men mature through sacrificing themselves, then why is it such a big ask for them to learn how to contribute to the things that society needs now and not just always want to play. It, it feels like what men want to do and what men are asked to do are not the same. And when we ask them to sa sacrifice and stop playing and work, then that working is now suddenly oppression. What am I misunderstanding? Why is asking a man to emote and learn quietly in a classroom and do his office job why is that oppression uh Lishan, i'd like to ask you a question on that first and that is um i've got a lot of chartered accountant friends and actuaries and i spend a lot of time on their spreadsheets so i'm not really aware of that um unwillingness to sit on a chair and work i've got a lot of friends who do that so is it maybe a bigger problem with a younger generation? Uh, is this something that you are personally experiencing? I mean, most of the guys I spend time with, and I've got quite a few young men that I see on a regular basis, are doing their master's degrees in mechanical engineering and stuff. You know, so maybe I've got a little bit of a bubble going here. I don't know. Um, but is this a major problem that you're experiencing? 
Is it a, 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 a undergrad problem on, on campus or where, where? Uh, it's just not something I'm exposed to all that much. So I just would no, like no. to know, are you sure? We, 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 yeah, why do you, we, why do you ask? I'm not questioning it. I'm sure it's true. Yeah. I'm just asking for a bit of background. Yeah. For example, um, a, a recommendation to maybe go speak to someone and get therapy. The accusation then often would be, um, you know, therapy is just listening to a leftist until you agree with them. You know, real men don't need therapy. It's it's a form of the longhouse. Therapy turns men into women. That's why women want men to go. Or um, pedagogically, I'm in education. So we are also being encouraged to, to, to accept the fact that Pedag our pedagogy is is girl centered and that it's actually harmful to boys for example asking them to sit still in a classroom when a boy wants to run around and play and i find that that extrapolates to the workplace that it's the workplace is accused of becoming um very feminized in where now you have to be political and now you have to be able to express your problem and and use your words and my question is why why um it feels like men see those requirements of modernity as modernity is forcing them to become women rather than this is what modernity asks of a man um what the it, it feels like the asking them to learn these skills uh, they experience it as oppression or feminization um and and is it do i misunderstand that it's it may it, maybe it is a form of feminization or is it just a form of maturity how how can i distinguish between I'm asking a man to be a woman or I'm asking a man to be mature. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a brilliant question. I think, I think, you know, I, I really get to use the million dollar question option. So I can't have another one, I suppose, but that is a, it is a very important question. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and yeah. So the fact is, okay. So one of the things that happens to a boy, infant, young man, uh, infant, boy, young man, father, elder, the boy in the, in the, in the, in the maturity stage boy one of the important things is that a boy must learn to do hard things so and that is my experience often more the father that is going to force the boy to do hard things than the mother if i would say as the dad listen tomorrow morning we're climbing stellenbosch mountain uh and then stefan would say yeah tv cake then sonia would say oh shame stefan is moog i will tv cake and i would say we leave at six um, and I wouldn't discuss the fact that I is Mook and I will TV cake. I, I, that's irrelevant information. The irrelevant information is we leave at six. It's just going to happen. So um, I had a funny thing. So 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 in terms of a boy, you must learn to do hard things. Once Jochen and I went crayfish diving when he was quite a bit older. I think he was already 17. Um, and it was the first time for some odd reason that he actually got good crayfish. And then he got book course, summit fever on these crayfish. And he started diving like a madman, uh, bringing up tons of crayfish. And then when we got out of the water, he said an interesting thing. He said, thank you, dad, for forcing me to go with you all those years. <laughs> I thought just that's funny. I wasn't aware that I was forcing him because I'm a quite a resolute dad. So it didn't appear to, to be forced. I just said, we leave at six. And then Sonia and Joch would capitulate and he would be in the car by six and off we'd go. And there wouldn't actually be even conflict about it because I was, I'm very resolute. So, but, but the fact is, so now he thanks me for forcing him to go all those years. And I'm okay. I didn't see it like that, but I take the point. So yes, boy must learn to do hard things. And often the older men are better at enforcing this than his mom. Okay. Not always. Some dads are capitulating and absent and all of that. So big problem. But in the, in the classic situation, the father would put more pressure on the boy to man up than the mother would. Okay, so a boy must learn to do hard things. That's it. There's no, there's no other way. They, they, they have to do that. And that's a boy task, by the way. So they should achieve that. That should be done and dusted by age 13. Um, so that I think, you know, and, and yes, it's a work in progress. And all of us need to come back to that. The boy needs to learn to do hard things. Yes, there's a lot of that. And in the modern age... I mean, it's a hellish grind, you know. Yes, a lot of time spent at a desk, um, but that's it. You have to do this now. Okay, so 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 I think they should do it. I mean, I, they definitely should do it. And, you know, I 
with the Buenos learn to do our things. Okay, so yes, in order to become an officer in the army, you first have to do a lot of difficult things as a grunt or as a GI, and then later on you can maybe become an officer if you do it properly. But by the time you become an officer, you've got much more freedom. You know, there's privileges that you have earned. Uh, and then you can make decisions and you can you can change things. Okay, so then in terms of the way the world is now, I do think it's uh, it's it's not ideal. So all the claims of it being, um, you know, more friendly for girls, more user-friendly for girls than boys, I think that's true. And personally, I'm spending quite a bit of time thinking about it, trying to develop a lifestyles, um, money-earning skills without abdicating responsibility at all towards the family um, and to make this modern age work. So I want to say two things uh, in terms of my and my approach to the modern world. Okay, both of these are a little bit redactable. Maybe you need to redact them, but okay. The first thing is, okay, this first one's not so bad. The first one is the reasonable man adapts himself to the environment. The unreasonable man expects the environment to adapt to him. Therefore, all progress is made by unreasonable men. <laughs> yeah. So the fact is, not unreasonable boys, big difference. Mm. But unreasonable men. When Werner von Braun said, we're going to the moon, he, 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 he created the German Association for Space Travel in 1923. That's when they were still flying with paper planes, open cockpit. And then he said, we're going to the moon. Okay, that's nutcase. And yet they went to the moon under his leadership. Elon Musk is a nutcase. He's an unreasonable man. Sure. But he's going to Mars and everybody knows that. So the unreasonable man, okay, so it can get a bit rough. Elon's probably a boy, by the way, um, because he's hard on women. So for me, the, the big distinction between a man and a boy is if the guy is not life-giving to women, then it's a boy. Donald Trump is a boy. They're male. Donald Trump and Elon Musk are male. But they're not life-giving to women. So boy um but they're all male okay so that's that that for me is the one thing i think we should encourage the young men yes you've got to do the hard work you've got to learn to do hard things but there is this reality of 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 of, of creating things of of actually envisaging and pursuing dangerous things that are um much more likely to fail um so i once again, like the previous conversation, yes, it's difficult. For now, they have to sit in class. I, I, I don't see any way around that. Um, and they have to find ways of passing their degrees. Um, yeah, so there's, there's no, there's no you, you can't get out of that. If, if you've got the opportunity, which is a massive privilege, of course, to go to university. Uh, manual labor just doesn't at this stage offer you social dominance or leadership or money. So that's unfortunately not possible anymore. So I think we'll encourage the boys to do hard things, but we will also teach them to explore um, and to conceive of unreasonable things and to pursue them, which is ironically enough how we got where we are, because the very Microsoft Excel that you are referring to, or Excel spreadsheets, was created by an unreasonable man. <laughs> Probably. Most likely it was created by an unreasonable man. Um, you know, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs, Unreasonable men, horrible men in some sense. I'm not promoting the horribleness, yeah. but but men that are determined to achieve things, and that does remain, I think, role models for all men. It's interesting, even in the in, in the, that many uh, MGTOWs or you know technically socially disengaged men, they are still wanting to create an app or wanting to do something significant or something you know radical, something unreasonable instead of just working hard eight hours a day or ten hours a day. They're trying to create things. So I think we should acknowledge that. And 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 boy must learn to do hard things. Can't get out of it. The world is tough. Um, there is a place for sacrifice and sitting still is then that. Make sure you've got a gym contract and a mountain bike. But and, and a and a surf ski like James. <laughs> and then off we go. I do wonder, you know, the the degree to what which the matriarchy has risen and overtaken. There is also toxic femininity and mature femininity, very much so. And every, not every, I can't generalize, but mature women also will be very quick to admit that we don't, 
want to have to go to war and be on the battlefield and fight and be strong and always be angry and always be assertive. But it, it, a woman <laughs> sees a gap that a man leaves and somebody has to fill it. There's a, there's a sense of responsibility that somebody has to fill it. And I do wonder to what degree the, 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 the creeping matriarchy is a product of desire for power and how much is it just a concern for an unfilled gap where, where men have left that gap. Um, and I, I don't understand, sometimes men feel so immobile. They, they feel so, so reluctant to expend energy. Um, I've, I've heard somebody also say that, you know, the best wife that you can get is the one that's just always cheerful and doesn't exhaust you. And when men talk about women, they will very, they will choose language that describes the ability to not expend energy on her um, or energy on a task. How, how men also, if they could think of anything, they would just go to the nothing box and think of nothing. It, it seems like men are very, very precious about conserving their energy. Um, and I, I, I don't quite understand that. And I don't, I think as, as, as a representative of my gender, we don't know what to do with that when men won't move. And I think that's why we get so accused of nagging and accused of, of, uh, of dominating is we don't want to dominate, but can you move? Is it, is it something that you observe in men, like an immobility, an apathy, a, a lack of willingness to expend energy? Um, and, and if so, what can contribute, what do you contribute um, it to? And if not, why do I experience men as so slow to move, so immobile? Yeah, listen, uh, a good question, you know, and something that took me a while to um, get used to. I can tell you that my generation, it's, I don't know, they, they're, they're emotionally boys, so they are probably lazy when it comes to engaging with their wives emotionally and dealing with the complexity of a woman. As Jim Wilder says, a woman puts a lot of pressure on a man and a boy simply can't handle it. So my generation has that problem. But most of my friends are very energetic um, and, and quite aggressive in business, you know, and having been kicked out of mainstream um, South African economy because of BEE, the amount of guys that I have that are earning dollars now with startups, it's like, and they're making good money. A lot of my, I mean, most of the guys that I know, they're just uh, sidestepping this whole thing and listing offshore companies and getting registered in Mauritius and off they go. So I don't experience that to be true of my generation. Um, the younger guys, I think, have, have been in the estrogen soup for too long. You know, I didn't. Uh, and that's something that I feel very strongly about. And I've got great compassion. And it's interesting for me to see Jordan Peterson weep about the brutality of trying to turn boys into women and wanting them to to, to act in such a passive and effeminate way. And, and Jordan Peterson actually sits and weeps about it. But, um, and so do I, but, but it, you know, okay. So are they passive and are they lacking things? Well, okay. So one of the, every good men's ministry will come up with the phrase reject passivity. So yes, it is a problem. It is a tendency that clearly was the case with um, Adam who was passive. Eve was doing a deal with the devil, so the snake was charming um, Eve, and Adam was present or not present. Either way, that's failure. You, you must be present when the snake talks to your wife, uh, and if you are present when the snake talks to your wife, then you kill the snake before he gets any, before he can sell her anything. So um, Adam watched Eve talk to the snake, then Adam watched Eve eat the stuff, or he wasn't present. Either way, failure. Um, and then the, the freaking guy went and ate the stuff himself. I mean, that's quite pathetic. Okay, so the passivity of men is, um, uh, you know, it's a big disaster. Christ is the antithesis. Christ goes down, he goes into a woman. He stays nine months in, e, uh, in uh, Mary. And then Christ goes into Israel and he overthrows every order that we can conceive of. He overthrows the law, he freaking deals with sin. He's just so aggressively male and masculine, you know, and so energetic, you know, so the opposite of Adam. Um, who had, yeah, okay. So, so I think we've got a great example there. Um, but we do need, from my side as an older man, I want to take the young boys and make men out of them and, and energetic men 
and and my favorite um, wall decoration, the most beautiful thing I can have on a wall is a map with arrows. I just love maps. I've got a map right here, a map with arrows, you know, and it's got a military feel to it. But, you know, we can use it for market penetration. We can use it for marketing campaigns. We can even use it for evangelism. Uh, and with this new Jim Caviezel movie, um, Sound of Freedom, you know, there is there, there are many very dangerous uh, things, many near-death experiences men can engage in um, and, and, and in order to be actually life-giving to women and children. So, yeah, the passivity is a problem, um, and uh, computer games plays a big role in that, I'm sure. Um, but the discouragement of young men generally uh, the encouragement to the, the whole toxic masculinity, all masculinity is now branded as toxic. You know, so the constant mantra is all ma men are toxic, become a woman. You know, so that was the mantra uh, that has been the mantra for a long time. And I think that zeitgeist, the prince of the power of the air, that is his message. Man, masculinity is bad, become a woman, you know, um, and for the men. Now, a woman is a wonderful thing. Women is an amazing thing. But men are also amazing and they should not become women that you understand. So um, this is not a competition between the two, but there is something profound that needs to be cooperated. So your question originally framed as are feministic women stepping into voids left by men? Yes, definitely. And I also think feministic women are responding to abuse of men because there has been a lot of toxic masculinity even by my definition, a lot of it has been toxic. Women have been abused, not loved, not supported. And now many women, and this comes through the centuries and the millennia, and now many women are in this modernity, the modern age, as you say, are angry. Um, and because they voted in the nanny state, they don't need to submit or deal with men anymore. And so now they're aggressive towards the men and the men have gone passive, which is uh, unfortunate and from my side, unforeseen, uh, failure. I didn't anticipate the passivity. I didn't anticipate it. I've been thinking about it a lot, and I think the the solution is to 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 um, to offer vision, to cast vision, to 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 present again a clear picture of a very masculine Christ, of a Christ. Everybody knows Jesus is gentle. Everybody knows Jesus is patient and kind and bears the fruit of the spirit. But Jesus, at the same time, overthrows the world order. He destroys the power of Adam and the power of Satan. Um, okay, and then that's excluding the, the graphic detail of the second coming. So I think when we start painting um, a picture of an aggressive, um, uh, proactive, uh, very active, energetic Christ, which he is, he's incredibly energetic, uh, passionate, and active, then that's going to give young men uh, something to look up to. Now, something that I've experienced in the church, and I've, you know, come up with a little phrase, might not be completely true, but I think it's largely true. And that is that since the Second World War, the God of the West has been a woman. Jesus is the daughter of God, and God is a big nurse in heaven. Um, and God loves us so much, he killed himself, and now the standard for salvation has become love. This is not true. This is rubbish. God is an alien. Look at... Um, Exodus, look at revelation of Jesus Christ, look at every apocalyptic manifestation. God, God is an alien, very scary and dangerous. Uh, yes, he sent Christ to die for the elect or for everybody, but only the elect's going to benefit. Um, and the rest are going to get destroyed violently. And the Bible is so graphic about all of that. You know, so I think when we start talking about the violence of God, the aggression of God, I think it's going to have a big influence on young men because they're going to actually relate to that a lot better. I can tell you something. Um, I will not serve a God who isn't inclined to kill me. The God I serve will kill me at the drop of a hat. The God that I serve is a very violent God. Yes, he loves me and he sent Jesus Christ. And if I get baptized and believe and I follow Christ onto that cross, then he will resurrect me new. And if I rebel against that, he will kill me and use me for dog food. Um, I don't doubt that. That's for me crystal clear from scripture. So me as a man... I will not serve a God who won't kill me. I don't. I wouldn't serve a God that's not dangerous. But I think we've robbed the young men of not preaching that, of telling them God's love is unconditional and you can do what you like. God's ever, ever going to follow behind you and give you another chance. Maybe the reformed people, and I understand much of the audience on the Crocs 
platform is reform, more reformed, I think they've got a better grip on scripture. But the charismatics have been overrun by this God is love thing. And actually, it's it's turned into a bit of a debacle, which is why the men are so slothful and disinterested to a large extent. Um, and then the other thing that's very interesting, what happens to an aggressive feminist, my opinion, like Oprah Winfrey, when she meets a proper elder like Nelson Mandela, you know what she does? She falls down on the ground and kisses his feet. Oprah Winfrey has no inclination to manipulate, control, usurp, or anything with Nelson Mandela. My observation is that women don't fight with men, but they fight with boys quite effectively. Um, when women are in the presence of masculine men, they automatically relax uh, and they start doing feminine things. If they're in the presence of effeminate men, weak men, or boys, then they get aggressive and they take over and it's a big protracted fight. That's my observation. And I've had personal experiences also of, of aggressive feminists um, who thank me for being a gentleman and say to me that they can see I'm part of the patriarchy, but I don't want to be. And I found it so funny because I quite like the patriarchy and I shouldn't use the word. Maybe you can redact that. I don't know. But but personally, I, I know it's a contaminated word, but so, okay. So not all of it, not what is understood on it in a bad language, but the, but the whole issue of of being a proper elder according to the biblical standard. I'm absolutely committed to that. And the funny thing is, I've yet to find a woman who gets upset when we are not promoting uh, manhood um, with the men. Stefan, my 17-year-old, that one of the of fear, he made a speech once. This <laughs> is funny. He made a speech at Paul Roos. Net a rechte man kan waarlik lief he. And then he had, a, he had this thing, he, he, he sort of, you know, um, took the basic tenets, the basic vectors of this infant boy, young man, father, elder. Um, and, he, and he made it into this Afrikaans speech, uh, proving that infants and boys can't love women properly, but men can. And the funny thing is, all the women um, in the judges, all the female judges gave him 100% for his speech. <laughs> I thought, okay, go figure. So when the, when, the, when the women run into real men, they actually relax and all the feminine go, femininity, uh, feminism goes out the window. That's my observation. I'm sure there's some nutcase-possessed women who will carry on fighting and <laughs> scratch Mandela's eyes out, but that's a fool. That's a foolish woman. Well, I have you so much of your afternoon. Thank you so much for your patience with me trying to express my confusion. Oh, I, appreciate, I appreciate your time very much. It's been fun talking to you. Maybe your ministry can contain some ask me anything sessions where just confused women can come ask, and ask, ask what is up with me. Because <laughs> I think that would be very handy. I think that would be very yeah. useful for well, women like me who are just so confused. But um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your time and for your talk at Crux. Um, it's, I, I think it's so good for for you know um for our crux members who are also thinking about these things that they at least have a face and a name and someone that they can now connect to if um somebody wants to learn more about your ministry or connect with you or, or contact you what what can they do where can they reach out uh Lishan, if you can put my phone number in the comment section yeah um and i yeah i've got a website called youngman.org.za which they're welcome to go to click on it um, or email me. I'm very happy to. I I'm, I never say no for a coffee date. That's great. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks for uh, the the sessions that you've done for us at, at the Crux Lounge. You're always welcome. Um, you know, for a follow up session. So you just let me know, and then we put the the details out, and then um, people can find out more about our Crux events at our website, Crux Africa. On our Instagram account, same crux.africa. You can see all of our posters always up there. We meet in the lounge. You can email me, lishan at crux.africa. Oh, lishan at crux.africa. That's it. I got it right. That's my email address at crux. And then oh. I can also send you the email. Um, uh, I can email anybody the details that want to join us. And it's, it's just a Christian community that is asking questions about life and vocation and calling and meaning. And yeah, we meet twice monthly on a Thursday, but it's it's very 
um, informal. So uh, let me know if, if anybody wants to join. Looking forward to joining Joby tomorrow morning for the Calvin's Institutes. Yes, yes. So we have the, the seminar series coming up on Saturdays and then we have the artist gathering that's coming up. So um, anybody watching this can also just Google uh, Crux um, Artist Gathering and then you can learn more about our upcoming art conference. Um, right. Registration closes in 10 days, so get your tickets. Cool. Rolf, thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. And uh, yeah, I guess see you in the lounge. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Nishan. Uh, Ciao.